Greetings, everyone. This is Inner Truth 5. Welcome to Spiritual Science. And now this is part two of Animals and Religion. And I'm going to be talking more about Buddhism and then continuing on discussing other religions. All right, so what does religion say about animals? So here's a Buddhist view. This is a Buddhist view of vegetarianism. This is from Tinjin from KVMI, the, the Kalorga Vegetarian Maitreya Indonesia, or Indonesian Maitreya Vegetarian Family. Most people say that Buddhism is not far away from vegetarianism. Is it true? In fact, most of Buddhists are not vegetarian. Buddhists must do five shila too. But most of Buddhists did not and do not obey the first shila. Do not kill. Eating meat is the cause of killing animals, and it is clearly a violation of the first shila. There, you see, I had pointed out in part one that all world religions say in one way or another, thou shalt not kill. And they just reword it according to the religion. So in Buddhism, it's do not kill. Buddha Dharma talks about Dukkha 3 and how to overcome Dukkha. So let us talk about, let's talk about how to overcome Dukkha. If we can control our heart and mind, then we can face the challenge of Dukkha and get the opportunity of peace and happiness. But if we eat meat, there will be no self-control and there will be no peace and happiness at all. A Buddhist should ease the dukkha, not add the dukkha by killing animal or eating meat. Eating meat, the cause, and killing animal, the effect, will never be the teaching of true Buddha Dharma. Buddhists want to save others from dukkha. This is the spirit of bodhisattva. Bodhisattvas, however, must develop the heart of metta or maitri. Metta means compassion or mercy. Vegetarianism supports people to do metta better. Save yourself first, so then you can save others. This is the spirit of arahat. Arahats at least should obey five shila to overcome dukkha. The first shila certainly talks about vegetarianism. Vegetarianism is surely the basic foundation to become bodhisattva and arhat in the same time because we do save ourselves from dukkha and we also save other living creatures from dukkha. But some Buddhists often say, vegetarian, it's a funny idea. Cows are vegetarian, but cows never go to nirvana. But we are human, not bovine. If we humiliate ourselves as carnivorous animal and do, and do killing for living, actually we throw away the very precious opportunity to overcome dukkha. In fact, killing animal is avoidable dukkha, and killing animal is against the spirit of Buddha Dharma that appreciates every life. Buddhists believe that the next Buddha is Buddha Maitreya or Buddha Metaya. Some scholars say Maitreya will come several billion years later based on Buddhist scriptures. But some people believe he will come soon because, in fact, the technology do accelerate the years. Information technology, for example, had broken down the national and traditional borders and it will ease him to do his great work. One of his great work is spreading the teaching of vegetarianism. Now, through information technology, many religions and institutions adopt vegetarianism. Maitreya or Metaya is a word derived from Maitri or Meta. So vegetarianism is absolutely the special character of Maitreya. Maitreya will always bless vegetarian people no matter what religions they, they have. That's why some people prefer to call him as Maitreya rather than Buddha Maitreya, because Maitreya belongs not only to Buddhists, 
but also to every religious vegetarian communities who wish peace and harmony in this earth. Vegetarianism is surely the first step into the holy earth of Maitreya. People in the holy earth will do compassion and mercy towards animal and human. Human and animal will be one big community, live in peace and harmony. It is not an utopian world, but a world of process. It depends on the process how to stop the killing of innocent ones. It is our continuous struggle to make people realize that vegetarianism is a matter of human sanity as well as a matter of health and an ecological issue. For more precise terminology, we will use Buddha Dharma instead of Buddhism. Western people translate Dharma as ism, so Buddha Dharma is translated as Buddhism, but actually Dharma is more than ism. Dharma means the truth. Buddha Dharma is the truth of the whole minds, the whole hearts, the whole words, and the whole actions of Buddha. Shila means ethic or rule. The five Shila are number one, do not kill. Number two, do not steal. Number three, do not lie or cheat. Number four, do not do sexual affair or abuse. Number five, do not consume everything that can make you addicted, like alcohol, tobacco, opium, narcotic, etc. The purpose of five Shila is preventing negative karma. Dukkha means suffering, misery, pain, or something that causes sadness, discomfort, or unhappiness. Buddha always spoke that life is dukkha because human tends to do negative karma. Life is dukkha is not a negative thinking but actually a real fact that we must face and solve with all of our sincere efforts. Nir means no. Vana means negative desire. Nirvana means extinguishing negative desire. A negative desire is the cause of dukkha. So we can say that nirvana is another word of overcoming dukkha. Buddha Siddhartha Gautama Sakyamuni himself spoke about Maitreya as the next Buddha. Maitreya is just like Messiah among Jews. Maitreya's movement was popular among Buddhists in India several centuries before Christ. In the same time, Messiah's movement was popular among Jews. Maybe the Silk Way is the only answer of this similarity. Some Jews believe that in the arrival of Messiah, in the day when heaven kingdom is on earth, people will be vegetarian. And the followers of Maitreya believe just the same. Some Jews are still hoping the arrival of Messiah. Some Buddhists are not only hoping the arrival of Maitreya, but also preparing for it, spiritually and physically, through developing Buddhist vegetarian families. Wow. This is so nice. Buddha being approached by the demigods to come and do what he did. Hmm. Okay, we're going to move on to Christianity and vegetarianism. Now let's see if this is going to be quite long, if I'm going to start. Well, okay, well, I'll go ahead and start it in this video, but I may have to continue it with a part three. So Christianity and vegetarianism. Okay, this is from someone's perspective, Rondi Elliot B. It had been long, no, it had long been an enigma to me as a Christian why my family and my church could be so compassionate toward humans and yet support societal norms which visibly contributed to animal suffering. I never heard anything to indicate that the way we regard our non-human brothers and sisters deserved a compassionate look. So when I began to study theology, I hoped that I would find in the scriptures confirmation for my vegetarianism and animal rights activism. I was not disappointed, and I also found contemporary theologians with supporting thesis. I would like to share with my fellow TVSers some things that may help you to understand 
how vegetarianism and compassion to non-human animals is in fact confirmed, not negated, by themes that thread their way into Judeo-Christian teachings. Judeo-Christian teaching. The Old Testament is very specific when it comes to what God said that we should eat. In the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1, there is a clear mandate in 129. Behold, I have given you every tree with seed in its fruit. This you shall have for food. This was God's intent in the Garden of Eden, but humans being imperfect, things changed. It would seem that later, after the flood, God gives permission to Noah and his descendants to eat flesh. Every moving thing shall be food for you. As I have, as I gave you green plants, I now give you everything. How could God say that? But if we read on, for the shedding of life blood, I will surely require a reckoning. Genesis 9, 2-5 What seems to be the point is that if we unnecessarily kill an animal, we will be accountable to our Creator. Of course, we now know that flesh eating is by no means necessary for human health. In fact, there's much evidence that it is in fact unhealthy to stray from a plant-based diet. In the New Testament, Jesus did not give clear directives about diet, but neither did he give guidance about many other important issues. Since Jesus seemed so often to speak obliquely, we are challenged to study not so much the specific words, but the themes often repeated in his teachings. Prominent among these are repentance, the kingdom of God, loving one's neighbor, and becoming as servant to the least. Undoubtedly, we must repent for centuries of animal abuse. In the kingdom of God, nonviolence to humans and animals will prevail. DNA research confirms that animals are indeed our neighbors, and who could be the least among us than those who have no voice that we can understand? It also seems significant that Christ, in his dying, became known as the Paschal Lamb. Then the ritual Jewish meal always contained a dead animal, a Paschal Passover lamb. Isn't it interesting that Jesus gave us bread and wine, grain and fruit, to eat thenceforth in remembrance of him? Hmm. I know that mainstream Western religion seems slow to embrace the nonviolent lifestyle which we vegetarians try to live. But we must be cognizant that the churches move slowly because they take seriously their important role as the guardians of tradition. As seminaries graduate more and more scholars researching environmental and animal related issues, I believe we will see change. Treatment, treating animals compassionately, and this includes not eating them, certainly seems consistent with the will of God for all of his created beings. From the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, trans by G. by G. J. Owsley. The fruit of the trees and the seeds and of the herbs alone do I partake, and these are changed by the Spirit into my flesh and blood. Of these alone and their like, shall ye eat who believe in me and are my disciples. For of these in the spirit come life and health and healing unto man, not by shedding innocent blood, but by living a righteous life shall ye find the peace of God. Blessed are they who keep this law, for God is manifested in all creatures. All creatures live in God, and God is hid in them. Ooh, very nice. Okay, so I'm going to stop there as a part two and continue, continuing on talking about Christianity and animals coming up in the next part.